Hey everyone, Star Wars Steve standing by, not for a classic game review, but for a review of an entire game series. A saga perspective, if you will. What's the name of the game? The Rogue Squadron series, in fact. The first Rogue Squadron came out in 1998 for the N64, and two sequels came out on the GameCube in 2001 and 2003. So let's start, obviously, at the beginning. Any Star Wars fan knows how important Space Flight was for the movies. They wouldn't have been nearly as entertaining without ships like the famous Incom TU-64 and the YT-1300 transport cruiser. Or the X-Wing and Millennium Falcon, for those of you not as privileged with my level of Star Wars knowledge. After all, I am Star Wars Steve. But enough about me. The N64 release set the standard for the series to constantly push the limits of the console it featured on. Factor 5, the developers, in conjunction with LucasArts for the game, wanted to wait to release the game until the N64 had its RAM expansion pack. When using the RAM expansion, the game looked amazing. The textures, resolution, and lighting got a huge boost even without the pack. To further push the limit, the game used a surprising number of human speech. In addition to chatter, the sound effects of lasers and TIE fighters really immersed the player. Rogue Squadron isn't just a game, it's an experience. As for actual gameplay, the story follows Luke Skywalker and later Wedge Antilles in a number of flight missions using the most popular ships like the X-Wing and Y-Wing and the Hoth Snowspeeder. It also introduced the V-Wing, a ship not featured in the movies. It also had a secret hidden craft, the Royal Naboo Starfighter from The Phantom Menace, before the movie even released in theaters. Unlockable content goes on to include three hidden levels you unlock by earning all the medals for every level. These are the race at Beggar's Canyon, the Death Star Trench Run, and the Battle of Hoth. But the basic game itself was so good that you could have fun without these. The levels were completely original in story, meaning they weren't from the movies themselves. The story ranges from in the middle of the original trilogy to six years after the Battle of Endor. I would get a huge thrill, however, from flying by recognizable landmarks in the movie like the Mos Eisley Spaceport or Jabba's Palace on Tatooine. Thankfully, the saga continued in 2001 when Factor 5 released Rogue Squadron 2, Rogue Leader, for the GameCube. Once again, this game pushed the limits of the console. It added the one-man gunship, the B-Wing, oddly enough shaped like a T, and others. It did feature some levels from the actual films, like the asteroid field level from Empire Strikes Back and the battles of Yavin, Hoth, and Endor. This was great since these were my favorite parts of the films, and the game used a number of great cinematics that almost duplicated ILM's work with the movie sequences. All wings report in. Red 10 standing by. Red 7 standing by. Red 3 standing by. Red 6 standing by. Red 9 standing by. Red 2 standing by. Red 11 standing by. Red 5 standing by. They even used audio from the films, in addition to extra dialogue from Dennis Lawson, the actual actor for Wedge Antilles, to link the game to the movie more strongly. I can't tell you how many times I've flown through the Death Star Trench to make that impossible shot into a thermal exhaust port only two meters wide. Sweet. Other sequences and levels not from the movies once again made it unique and fun. New levels include capturing Shuttle Tidarium and extra fuel from Cloud City to make the Battle of Endor possible, among others. Overall, you can honestly say LucasArts and Factor 5 bumped everything up in this one. They did it again two years later with their final release for the series, Rogue Squadron 3 Rebel Strike. This game once again featured a whole new level set, but it featured so much more. Great gameplay and cinematics return, of course, with the use of some cinematics lifted straight from the movies. <laughs> Also, it's two games in one, literally. In addition to the normal story, the co-op campaign lets you play through every single level of Rogue Squadron 2 with a friend. Two games in one. There's also a number of multiplayer modes. Since this one was released in the middle of the prequel trilogy, you get to see some cool references in the movies and levels, like on Geonosis, where you fight battle droids and then later fly Obi-Wan's abandoned Jedi Starfighter into orbit. In this level, you get to use Jango Fett's sonic charges, how they're in Obi-Wan's ship, I don't know. But there's also other cool unlockable content, like the three original arcade games from the original trilogy. Arcade games, yeah. And a behind-the-scenes documentary about the game's making. Factor 5 added so much to this game, literally pushing the GameCube to its limit. You could jump out of your Starfighter and pilot ground vehicles such as the ATST speeder bike and so on. These really worked for the game, but the one thing that didn't work as well as the others, however, is the ground fighting. You play as Luke, Han, or Wedge who get to run out of their ship around shooting stormtroopers. The interface for this part is clumsy and often doesn't make sense. You'll find that you can't target the enemy you want sometimes. However, the rest of the game improved enough from the first one to excuse this flaw. The series shines as one of the greatest sets of Star Wars games. It surely earns the title of best flying games in a huge ocean of Star Wars games. They all have so much to offer, even today, which is why I chose it for VGHL's first ever Saga Spective. So I'm Star Wars Steve again, and the Force will be with you.
always.